Exzellenzen, Your Excellences, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, lassen Sie mich ganz Let am Anfang dieser Rede ein Zitat aus meiner Rede von vor genau einem Jahr stellen. Ich habe damals sagen ago, dürfen, at the time das Ziel dieser Rede der Zukunft Europas, die ich jedes Jahr in Vienna halten werde, ist es, auf die Speech on the Future of Europe, ist, which I will now hold each year on the 11th of January, is to, on the one hand, highlight European questions, on principle, on the other hand, also then respond against the backdrop of current challenges. I will also always present specific political ideas on how to design European politics, uh, on which we still die have to work Einigung further. End of quote. The European Unification is, and um, the Minister for European Affairs, Ed Stadler, has also addressed that in his speech, is a, history, is a story of success. But it can only be seen as such if you also can offer solutions the for the current challenges. The current challenge is the Russian war of attrition against Ukraine. This, however, should not conceal our view on the geopolitical ambitions in China. Dealing with Moscow and Beijing will be one focus of this speech. Europe's weakness and necessary consequences for European politics certainly are the second pillar of this speech. The world and its order, and very specifically the European order, no longer is what it still was a year ago, we'd all been hoping for. As early as in 2014, Russian President Vladimir Putin started a war of aggression against Ukraine. He quickly took the Crimea Peninsula and annexed it, and uh, the treason by generals in the Ukrainian army did not make this any better. Then followed the attack on eastern Ukraine, which was still very skillfully hidden below the level of a real invasion, and then the uh, shutdown of flight MH17, most bloody highlight. A year ago, this attack still was this frozen conflict which uh, the arms size in 2014 also negotiated by European countries had brought us, but Russia had already deployed its army on the borders of Ukraine and Belarus with the terror regime of Alexander Lukashenko had been used as a deployment area for an attack. In January 2022, there was a high-level meeting between the United States and Russia on the situation in Ukraine. Europe, the European Union, did not participate in the meeting. Analysts uh, at the time regarded Ukraine as a buffer state, that is a buffer between Europe and Russia. This is a choice of word that remembers the notion of Zwischen Europa, Intermediate Europe, from the time between the First and the Second World War. At the time, Russia assured that it was not planning any war. You might recall the pictures of this long, large table with Vladimir Putin on the one hand and the European partner on the other, whom Putin assured that there will not be any war. The European partners wanted to believe this assurance, and Europe, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, at the pan-European picnic on the 19th of August 1989, after the solution of the Warsaw Pact, and after the end of the Soviet Union, both in 1991, was uh, really going for the end of wars in Europe. There was an illusion of eternal peace. Military capacities, and with them also many capacities for catastrophes, were radically unbuilt. This peace dividend was cashed in. The money was invested into welfare redistribution program, but we could also say uh, purchasing votes. At the same time, international contracts and treated were supposed to guarantee a new era of peace and, were, uh, and uh, affluence. It was still the UDSSR that had signed the CSE final document uh, defining the non-aligned status of sovereign states. At the end of 1990, the Charter of Paris for New Europe followed and again anchoring this non-aligned status, even after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact. The relationship between Moscow and Kiev was regulated by the Budapest Memorandum of December 1994, a treaty, however, that 
also apart from bilateral relevance, also had massive importance for curbing nuclear threats, because guaranteeing borders through the guarantee powers that would be the nuclear powers of Russia, the United States and Great Britain, the nuclear power of Ukraine financed on nuclear armament. All these treaties and some more were supposed to make war in Europe impossible, but reality does not always live up to treaties. And by overcoming the Iron Curtain, the first wake-up call already was heard. That is, to not uh, sacrifice uh, Europe's capacity to defend itself uh, for the sake of uh, the illusion of eternal peace. And please do not take hope for illusion. In former Yugoslavia, the Serb dictators of an which started its wars for a larger Serbia, which brought incredible suffering for the region. We must remember the bloody songs of the Chetniks in Vukovar, as well as uh, the massacre of Srebrenica and the attempted annihilation of the Kosovars, which was then all ended by targeted military strikes of NATO led by the United States. In Europe, however, those security experts still were in the uh, mood for advocating the demolition of high-cost military capacity since there was a pre war in time of about 10 years for large conflicts. But the Green Men on Crimea did not stick with this pre warning period and had already uh, had the peninsula under its control before the experts could even think about how to respond to new challenges for Europe. European security. And even in 2014, that is after the Russian attack on Georgia in 2008 and then Ukraine in 2014, in Europe, no one wanted to take any conclusions from the situation. Putin was supported here, and instead of developing new concepts as to how to deal with threats from Moscow, dependence of Russian gas was still stepped up. Concepts for a diversification of suppliers were toppled from the highest political levels in Austria and Germany were positionally prone for the temptations of cheap gas from Russia. They could even make themselves believe that a switch to alternative energy sources would be completely unproblematic. Former representatives of governments from many European countries had no problem of being on the wage list of Russian companies uh, and lobbying Russian interests. Please forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, if I now have taken a longer look back, especially on the development which had started in 1989 at one of the central moments uh, of humanity, but which right now has brought us into a very threatening and dangerous political situation. I have so far only focused in Europe and not spoken about the brutal wars going on in Africa or the many other dangerous spots on this planet or the brutal suppression of the freedom movement by the regime in Iran. And it would also be beyond this presentation dealing with all these challenges. We cannot turn back the wheel of time. We can only learn from the current situation and the events that have led up to this current situation so that they would be prepared for future challenges. Just as there are criminals and always have been in every society at every time, these criminals also exist at every time in the society of states. The old saying, civis partem parabellum, so be prepared for war if you want peace. Unfortunately, it still applies, and we we'll continue to do so. Nothing is more dangerous than being rich and weak. And this is precisely the current situation in Europe now. Even though, of course, affluence and riches are also dwindling away, the redistributing way for state, after all, does not create affluence, it just redistributes it. And affluence is created by innovation and investments, both have required adequate friendly conditions. If you forget these basic principles and you give in to the temptations of bureaucracy, the innovative forces will wander off and investments will look for reach to better conditions. But let us still stick with the geopolitical situation, which today is no longer the same as it was 30 years ago when the Eastern Bloc collapsed. 
at the time, the Western system of the United States and free Europe, on the one hand, were facing the Soviet Union as the second superpower and the Eastern Bloc system, which it decided over. The West definitely prevailed in the Cold War. This offer of freedom, democracy and a free economy was so tempting that practically all countries of the former socialist world strived to join NATO and the European Union in Europe. This offer still so attractive to the countries of Southeastern Europe, but also Ukraine and Georgia also want to join these alliances. Russia, after all, has lost its status as superpower, but it was still strong enough with its uh, military to take part in different wars or even decide them. This was and still is the case in the relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but has also proved true in the Near East, in the war in Syria. Putin, at the time, intervened militarily in the favor of Assad and bombed himself back to the stage of world politics. Without him, there was no chance of a peaceful solution in the region. He might have enjoyed this position and today would be a popular part of the United States as well as the Europeans and other countries on this planet. And he might have made more money selling gas and other raw materials, money that Russia so urgently needs in order to also create a, a highly civilized society, even outside large cities. His dream of founding a new Russian empire, sort of a mix between the Soviet empire and the old Tsarist empire, has now brought him into a situation which one day will qualify him as one of the major war criminals in history books. Many wanted to believe that Putin was acting rationally and with good information, but both assumptions have proven wrong. If he really thought that he could quickly take Kiev, eliminate the president there, install a puppet regime and then control Ukraine, then this was because he had been wrongly informed of the real situation in his neighboring country, so he was not adequately informed. And if he were acting rationally, he would have continued to go for good trade relations with Europe and the rest of the world. First, this might have got him much more money than was possible with the war. And secondly, he would have had much more influence on the world stage. The Russian war of attrition against Ukraine has the potential of lasting long into this year, even beyond. In our scenarios, we must also consider a new invasion into Kyiv uh, via Belarus and therefore also new refugee streams into European countries. But no matter how long this war will last, Russia will have lost its status as world power after that. China, Russia's old rival in Asia, will benefit from this. Russia already is seen as a junior partner only by the Chinese uh, leaders. China has long overtaken Russia and today is one of the major threats for the system of freedom, democracy, rule of law and the free economy that is represented by the West in general. However, we must be clear that this Russian war on Ukraine is not just an attack on Ukraine, it is also an attack on Europe our way of life, our democracy, freedom, human rights, rule of law, market economy. It is a war that has been kicked off by Eastern despots against Western democracies. Putin despises the European way of life. And despite all criticism that we also sometimes have on European politics, no European can ever be interested in subjecting himself to Putin's despotism. This is something not even rich Russians want because they send off their kids to schools and universities in the West. And since we cannot be interested in subjecting to the despotism of the war criminal Vladimir Putin, we must also be clear that this war can only end with victory of Ukraine and the defeat of Russia. This is not about, as sometimes we even hear from high-level political circles in Western Europe, 
heeding European uh, Russian security interests and offering Putin an exit from the war that would protect his face. No one has injured Russian security interests. No nuclear weapons have ever been installed in Russian neighborhoods, as had been the case at the moment of the Cuban crisis on the border of the United States. No one had attacked Russia. The war crimes committed by Putin so far have definitely denied him all rights of uh, keeping his face. He must face a war criminal tribunal, and as, as must do his collaborators and the, 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 the regime. In Moscow must be changed, as must be the regime in Minsk. And Russia also must pay reparations, which is why the West should confiscate about uh, uh, approximately $300 billion in currency reserves that are kept by the Russian Central Bank with seven Western Central Banks. And that money must be used for reconstructing Ukraine. It would be negligent not to do that, and the same must apply to the frozen assets of Russian oligarchs. Putin's system must pay repressions. And I don't appreciate the historic comparison saying that Russia must not be humiliated, such as Germany should not have been humiliated in the Treaty of Versailles, which, after all, just led to Hitler and the Second World War. It is quite correct that the Second World War was a consequence of Western weakness towards Hitler. There were no consequences when he occupied the Rhinelands and the response to the occupation of Sudetenland was not the military response by the Allies, but a conference where Hitler's conquests so far, and that also included Austria, were accepted. The consequences should be remembered by all those who speculate that Putin and his regimes might be kept happy by offering him Crimea, eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine. If you want to learn from history, we can only draw the conclusion that we must Ukra uh, support Ukraine so massively in them, uh, thinking military equipment and information that it can push back Russia into the borders uh, guaranteed by uh, Budapest memorandum. This, of course, can destabilize Russia, but let us remember Russia is a colonial power and colonial powers disintegrate. Same applies to Russia. The question always is for how long colonized people so then accept this rule. So far, the minority peoples in the Russian colonial realm basically just serve as cannon fodder for the Russian army. This is not a uh, very satisfying situation for these people, so we must expect scenarios that Japan might mean a very uncalm end, end of the Russian Empire. Japan and Germany at the end of the Second World War capitulated without any conditions. Both countries, after this capitulation, then set out in a way that guaranteed democracy, the rule of law, and an economic uh, upswing. So we should not fear this military defeat of Russia, but should see it as an opportunity that this country also can have democracy, rule of law, and a free economy. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let's return once again to this one power which we must not forget about despite all geopolitical developments, and that is China. China is thinking in long term. In 2049, the country will celebrate its 100th anniversary of the foundation of the People's Republic of China. And that's a date that we must remember when dealing with Chinese politics, because after all, this Beijing is clear goal to have integrated Taiwan completely in China by then. This also tells us something about the possible time horizon. If China wants to reach this goal militarily, after all, a full integration means that by then, both the war as well as the reconstruction will be done and dusted by that date. China is seeing massive rearmament, and you can best see that in the Navy and in a comparison with the United States. The United States have seven Navy shipyards. People Republic has 19, and the 
Navy shipyard of Cheongang on the Yangtze River has a bigger capacity than all seven Navy shipyards in the United States together. China now is the world's largest Navy. For China, South Chinese Sea is what the Caribbean is for the United States. As early as in 2013, President Xi Jinping launched the New Silk Road project, a large economic and foreign policy prestige object, with the clear objective of creating a economic area dominant by China, where European and African states are closely linked up by both on land and by sea. Numerous countries around the globe have already participated, and Beijing has also said other European and other economic and financial institutions that serve as important instruments for geopolitical purposes. At the same time, the totalitarian communist regime in Beijing has fallen a strategy of challenging our already known system of civil and political freedoms, the system of human rights. Using its own ideology, China is trying to create a new international order. And the already existing influence of China has shown when individual EU countries then blocked a clear stance of the European Union towards China. Ladies and gentlemen, ships stuck in the South Chinese seas are very relevant for the European economy, something I no longer have to explain to you after two corona years and all the uh, disorders. And I'm not speaking about the security situation and the other geopolitical consequences by saying so. Or to put it differently, how many more wake-up calls we need in Europe to understand that this politics and this policies are just taking us into uh, oblivion. So it isn't for Chinese tourists uh, guaranteeing no perspectives for the future because a Chinese dissident has got nothing to do with pleasure, but just a full control of our lives, uh, as we already have in the social credit system in Europe. We need to create security for Europe, so unity. I'm not favoring a centralist Europe, nor do I favor just nostalgic uh, small country policies, uh, because we can only work together. And the war in Ukraine and free Europe is a good uh, case in point. Many lament that the United States are so present and uh, providing so massive support, but at the same time, wars only follow their own interests. If they did not do so, I'm not quite sure whether we could still lament about that. Because it is time that the European Union really starts its own European foreign and security policy. You might certainly have heard this plan repeated in the past. And we'll have to repeat it time and again in the future. But European foreign politics not only means to coordinate the international politics of the 27 member states by the high representatives for the joint foreign and security policy, but it also means an EU foreign ministry with a foreign minister at its head. And this requires the core of the European constitution specifying specifically this international competence for the European Union. This is a point which, after all, would also be up to all requirements of subsidiarity, just like now. Every foreign minister is subjected to parliamentary control of his country. An EU foreign minister would be subject to direct control of the European Parliament, which is directly elected by European uh, citizens. This is about uh, sovereign, sovereignty, often mentioned by national egoists, because sovereignty, ladies and gentlemen, in a specific case, means the capacity to act and to design. European foreign policies would definitely have a much higher value than a pure national policy. 
Of course, such European um, security and international politics also needs means effective protection of its external borders. And of course, the Schengen area must also then include Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia. This freedom to travel is one of the major achievements of the European unification. It's got nothing to do with asylum and illegal migration, but it definitely includes the protection of European foreign borders. And this is also the idea when the Schengen area was first created and the European Parliament has given a very clear stance on that. But just as in foreign politics, member states still wanted to keep protection of their borders as a national affair, and it was in particular those countries shouting loudest for European border protection, even though they also regard the protection of the borders as national competence also is a fact. The erratic politics of many member states can be seen from the liberalization of visa for the citizens of Kosovo. There was no other country who had fulfilled as many requirements for this liberalization as Kosovo. And even though they have done so, for years there have been egoistic blockades of individual countries against that. If you know me, you know that I'm basically an optimist, so therefore I assume that the agreement to nominate under the Czech presidency will still be true in 2024, and Kosovars will be able to enter the European Union without a visa, including those countries who have still not recognized that country, but I'm not as daring as to put my hand into the fire for that. Balkans, the Balkans is a region for Southeastern Europe where we need a clear strategic politics of the European Union, as we could see from the latest tensions in the north of Kosovo. It's not the first time that Serb President Alexander Vucic has put oil into the fire, and this is what Serbia also does in Montenegro and Bosnia-Herzegovina. The enlargement policy offers the European Union instruments to build up the necessary pressure on Serbia. The European Union must only act together as one and be able and willing to use these instruments in a very targeted manner. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of my speech, I made a short note on the dwindling riches of Europe and its dependence on delivery chains and supply chains. You all know the debates on the supply bottlenecks in Austria also in the supply of certain drugs. We now keep hearing hearing people ask for greater interference of politics, providing greater resilience. This not only sounds logical, but it's also necessary. Just like every Russian person has candles at home and something to light them with because there might be a blackout. You also need to have certain stocks in order to be able to handle certain crisis periods and catastrophes. Austria has a concept of comprehensive national defense, including economic defense. In former times before the people had started to cash in the already addressed peace dividend, it might have been a task of the military to keep up certain stocks in order to be able to preserve certain infrastructures. I have already spoken about uh, the military. The European security politics also means that we need to bring our military capacities back to a level where we can defend ourselves. And even though I too like military, music at certain occasions, we need definite um, specific equipment to defend ourselves. We need a European armament industry and we need European armament budgets that are more than just an excuse and, of course, much more intense European cooperation. What is decisive, considering all the challenges that Europe is facing, will be to have the right frame of conditions in place. We must increasingly hear from all European directions that uh, the state should come in, that globalization should end, that we need new government measures. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is the wrong way. This is not the success recipe that made Europe great once. The state, of course, has a task of securing law and freedom, including foreign and uh, security politics. This is a classical task of the state, but it's not the task of the state to manage the economy. Such concepts have always failed in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Sharing tasks is good, 
and shared tasks on a global level is also good because it helps us increase our affluence. But still, we need a security policy which is either able to prevent wars and crises or at least guarantee supply safety in the event of a crisis. The necessary reindustrialization of Europe will not happen through state interference. Recuperating productions that I've already mentioned drugs earlier on will not be able through state regulations, but in Europe we must return to the reasonable uh, principles of an order policy, as we remember from the economic miracle politics of Ludwig Erhard, because companies produce where they have good conditions. If we keep suffocating companies with more and more red tape, if we do not manage to cut the secondary wage costs, if we still have a lack of work Force, uh, even though we have lots of unemployment, we know that the, the conditions are not right. It is not a coincidence that highly qualified people are leaving Europe. It is not a coincidence that the Silicon Valley, and I'm not referring to the geographical notion, but the um, notion for high technology and innovation is in the United States and not in Europe. This wake up call was also unheard in Europe. Even though I know that for politicians it is also more comfortable to promise new uh, benefits of a welfare state than requesting efforts. And for many people it might also be very tempting to wait for the state to uh, then sort them out. But as realists, we know that this is an illusion because land of plenty only exists in children's books. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I have also been asked about the corruption scandal in recent weeks that is shaking the European institutions. Power corrupts, and absolute power, of course, corrupts even more, to put it in the words of English philosopher Lord Acton. By the way, this principle is a very good example that the state should not be given too much power least of all in areas that are not part of the duty of a state, because the more bloated the state, the more corrupt it will be. Affairs of this kind, however, also a call-up to think of, about the character formation of politicians. Politicians certainly have a very um, strengthful job for which they are paid very well in order for them to be uh, protected against corruption. But of course, they all speak uh, people without any conscience, and that is the reality of human life. In healthy democracies, however, such cases of corruption are uncovered and people responsible are called to account. Every case is a, remember, uh, is a memory that we always need to work on uh, the political culture, but we need to quite decisively work against those people, those populists who use this corruption scandal for blackening and questioning the European Parliament as such and European institutions in general. To believe that national states can solve everything better than they would be any corruption is something that certainly is not realistic. I do not know of any request to abolish uh, communities because there have been mayors being um, involved in corruption affairs or having to resign because they abused the office. Because of the current geopolitical situation, we need a strong Europe to protect our freedom. This is something that I hopefully have showed you with the many challenges that we have already mentioned. Populists that need to be interested in that because their objective is um, dispute and not solution problems. Minister Edstadler, in her speech, spoke of politics of a change in time. The political, economic and social challenges show that we must not lose any time in then also uh, meeting Europa, these challenges the with reality. Europe, the Western world, has the right instruments in its hand with freedom, democracy, market economy and the rule of the law to take up this fight against the challenges of our time. We just need to use these instruments in the right way. We must be prepared to overcome our uh, own uh, uh, comfort. We're living in interesting times. A joint Europe is our security and our future. And this is what we need to decide together.